No, another one in our series Sundays with Belta. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Leni Dunn to you from Denmark. Um, I'll talk a little bit about herself, I'll talk a little bit about uh, why we have invited her, and then I'll just pass the floor to her very quickly. Uh, so uh, Leni Dunn from, from um, Denmark, she was from 1973 onwards already involved in the development of learner autonomy, partly as a teacher at secondary level in a place called Karlslunde, partly as an educational advisor at University College of Copenhagen. And together with Leinhardt Legenhausen from Germany, uh, she carried out a research project, language acquisition in an autonomous language learning environment. And that was in 92 up to 96. In the 90s, she was also co-convener of the scientific mission of learner autonomy in AILA. And since 2008, she's been joint coordinator of the IATEFA Learner Autonomy Special Interest Group. In 2004, she received an honorary PhD in pedagogy from Karlstad University in Sweden. And she's written extensively on learner autonomy and related matters such as differentiation, evaluation, teacher roles, learner roles, and recently also inclusion. Even though she's now retired, she's still very active, as you can see, and she helps spread the word about this topic via all kinds of workshops, talks and publications and via this uh, webinar as well. The reason we've uh, invited uh, Leni is uh, very specifically because we have a um, conference coming up uh, next March, on the 3rd and the 4th of March. This conference is uh, hosted by the University of Antwerp and it's in um, together with the LASI group of IATEFL. And we've been asked to play a role in the preparation of it as well. And this conference is just a very nice and a unique opportunity for all of you to, to learn more about learner autonomy. And Lenny Dunn will be one of the keynote speakers there as well. So you can certainly consider this um, webinar a little bit as a teaser for what is to come in March in Antwerp. So I repeat the dates, they are 3 and 4 March, University of Antwerp, a very nice location in a beautiful university as well. And Elke Rulens, one of the participants, is actually representing um, the university here as well. So you will get to see her in full and live during that conference as well. Could I ask you to, uh, when you have questions, to remember the slide the questions are about so we can actually go through the questions after the presentation and that would help us to um, just remember uh, which slide the question was all about. So, Leni, thank you very much for being with us today. I'd like to pass on the floor to you. <clears throat> thank you, Jürgen. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Mm. This is the problem. Yes, they say, they say yes. You say yes, Jürgen. Thank you very much for the presentation and uh, welcome to those of you who are present. I was told it would be Belgian teachers main, uh, mainly and uh, students from Belgium. But I can see from the list of participants that that is not the case. However, I'm looking forward to this hour that we are going to have together. And I do hope that my word somehow will go get through to you. Uh, I also have to tell you that this is my first and perhaps last uh, webinar because I'm more nervous than I've ever been giving a talk because I know that I am not good at not having an audience that I can see. It's ridiculous to sit looking at my own words. But hopefully we'll get some nice uh, interaction after my presentation. That is what I'm looking forward to because I'm not quite sure where your interests are, what you find strange. So it can be uh, together with a specific slide, but it will also be general questions. So I'm looking forward to that and I'll get started. And if I look up and down is because I have to fix uh, arrows and things, but let us start. First of all, the title, how to recognize an autonomous learning environment is very close to as if any of you have read my blog that uh, in 94, I wrote uh, an article how to recognize an autonomous classroom. And that's where I got the idea for this title, because what is it that strikes people and what I find important, where it is that it 
differs, the autonomous learning environment differs from what I would call a traditional uh, learning environment. In this case, it's a, a language learning environment. On this front page, you can also see my mail address. You are more than welcome to contact me after the uh, webinar in the future on this mail address. And perhaps we can continue discussing these items. Mm -hmm. that, that's where I did, did the first thing wrong. Here we are. Uh, I will just give a brief summary of why I see learn autonomy as important or necessary. Then I'll go into the main presentation, the important elements that show that it's an autonomous learning environment. I'll say a little about the results, but in general, the results will be the ones that we'll be talking about in Antwerp. And after that, I'll add plenty of time for questions and answers. I hope that that will be okay with you. First of all, why learn autonomy? I just selected a few that made me start uh, in 1973. So if you didn't uh, know, then you can tell that I'm old. This will happen, okay, sorry. This is the situation when I started in 1973. I was stuck with a group of 15-year-old uh, uh, children, mixed ability, and they were, like all others at that age, and with the traditional teaching uh, background, inactive, they didn't take any uh, decision, and they didn't, didn't make any decisions. They were what I would call a spoon-fed learner. And when I told them something and or gave them an activity, their reaction was, it doesn't skip. So I lost my temper and banged my hand into the desk and said, okay, if you're not satisfied with what I do, what do you want? At least they got their feet off the table and stopped chewing the chewing gum. But that was the beginning of my road towards developing learn autonomy. I was supported in those days by uh, Richard Rogers' book, Freedom to Learn, and I especially liked his point about what school, what kids love, have the quality of active learning environments, the activity, not sitting there doing things that were of no interest to them. And the second thing about this quote was that I suddenly saw the importance of the, the students being shareholders of their own learning. So my question to myself was really, how can I do that? Along with this idea of getting them involved, I also thought of uh, the Chinese saying, give a man a fish and you will feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you will feed him for life. So the question about lifelong learning was obvious. How can that be done? I was supported by Trim's foreword to the report by the Council of Europe about autonomy and self-access, uh, uh, self-centered learning from 1988. He said, no school or even university can provide its pupils or students with all the knowledge and the skills they will need in their active adult lives. Actually, a view that is more important nowadays than it was in 88, because we know that things change already tomorrow. Therefore, it's more important for a young person to have an understanding of himself or herself, an awareness of the environment and its working, and to have learned how to think and how to learn. This quote really struck me as being important for developing learn autonomy. 
At the same time, I came across this cartoon that also struck me as being important. I taught Scott how to read this. I can't hear him whistling. I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. So I really grasped the difference between teaching and learning. And this view, of course, not of course, but it was supported by Douglas Barnes uh, in his book from 1976 from Curriculum to Communication. To learn is to develop relationships between what the learner knows already and the new system being presented to him. And this can only be done by the learner himself. In other words, it's the learner that learns. It's not the teacher that teaches him. And we have known that all the time. Teachers know that uh, students do not learn what they believe themselves to be teaching on the contrary. Something sometimes they do, but not generally speaking. Therefore, with these uh, reasons for developing learn autonomy, I started thinking, how can it be done? So this is a very simplified model of developing learn autonomy. Here you see a normal work plan that all teachers follow. They plan what to do. They see to it that the plans are carried out. They tell the learners what to do and how to do it. The teacher in the traditional classroom evaluates the outcome very often outside and after the lesson. It was the same I did when I, I was a young teacher in 73. And when I left the classroom, I thought that I was wrong, that I did something wrong since they weren't active. So I went back home and prepared better, came up with better skills and better ideas and better tasks, and went back to the classroom. So in general, in 1973, my classroom was teacher and teaching directed. However, what is important is that when we develop, oh, something wrong with this, I don't know why. When we develop learn autonomy, we are aiming at a learning and learner-centered environment. It's a matter for the teachers to let go and for the learners to take hold. Mind you, it's not either or, it's both and. Also, I can tell you that it's more difficult for teachers to let go and for the learners to take hold. What I'm going to show you before I go into the, the elements in the autonomous uh, learning environment is an interview from the DVD that I had the chance to, or video I had to, the chance to do in 1998. The title of this is, it's up to yourself if you want to learn. And it shows a classroom activities and classroom organization with a group of 15 year old uh, students. During that time when we did the recording, the photographer saw to it that we took aside two of my learners without my knowledge and interviewed them. And he asked them, think about your English lessons. And this is where, this is what came out of this interview. And now it's up to you, John. Make you somewhere. Yes, I'm ready for this. Here we go. Techniques, techniques. Okay. No. Is it coming? When I think of English, I think uh, most in terms of uh, group. Yeah. 
normally if they don't have open mouth in the classroom, I can show you. Hold on. I hold on. And good as we can and in the beginning we um, had sort <laughs> a sort of um, a list on the blackboard called helpers Good if we could start now we don't have such a list but we still walk through yeah move it down there yeah it's getting better now blackboard called helpers now we don't have such a list but we still walk to two and one when i say i like to work with um animals and then then Lenny write it down and then she asked other people is If some other people like to work with this too, and then we make the groups. You, Lenny. What do you mean by that? Did I go on or what? Did I press a button or did I go on or what? The video is done. What does that mean? Got the idea. Okay, so it was only me who couldn't see it or what. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so I hope that you've seen it because I'm going to refer to it. But never mind. We go on to the next one. What I'm going to do now, it's okay as long as the rest of you have seen it, then I know it more or less by heart. Anyway, what I'm going to do now, this was the, the, the ideas, what I like about it was actually also when Carsten said, when we think of two things of English, he would say that it's something that we do. I like his way of making it clear, the act, active in uh, participation of the students. Anyway, I'm now going to tell you what I see as the two elements when developing learn autonomy. I'll briefly just mention them here, and then I'll go back to um, to talking about them in uh, in detail. The first thing that you probably notice when you enter an autonomous classroom is the role of the teacher. The teacher is not at the blackboard or whiteboard or whatever they're called today, but the teacher is sitting with a group of learners or with individual learners and actually taking part in their learning. The other thing that you will notice is that they are seated in groups. That does not mean that they necessarily have to do group work, but they are seated in groups. I return to the advantages of that. But seating in groups means also that they are actually helping each other. A lot of peer tutoring uh, is going on, not as a demand, but 
probably my view because they are seated in groups and it's easier to get hold of a peer and less frightening than getting hold of the teacher. Another close thing is really uh, the question about authenticity. I'm not talking about authentic materials that we used a lot in the 70s, but I'm talking about authenticity in the classroom. And I'll just mention two, communication, the communication that is going on, and also the social behavior among the participants. You can't see it from uh, far away, but if you get closer to the groups, to the seatings, then you will realize that the activity types are definitely different to the ones that can be seen in a normal or traditional course book run uh, classroom. Especially the type of activities going on involve the learner's identity and especially their previous knowledge. They make use of what they bring to the classroom. Next comes that whatever they do is documented. And that is striking, that there is a clear documentation of learning. When I first started, I got this idea from uh, the English primary school education. It struck me whenever I visited a school that you could see learning take place. Wherever you walked, in the classrooms, in the corridors, you could see the learning taking place. It's very often believed that autonomy leads to chaos, that students can do whatever they like to do, and there is no order, and that is not true. On the contrary, in the autonomy classroom, when it's needed that the students take over, it's absolutely necessary that it's clear and visible aims, demands, and expectations wherever you see. It can be in the laptops, it can be on the walls, it can be in their portfolios, but it's necessary. And these days where we talk about inclusion, it has become even more necessary. Within these aims and demands, activities and expectations, it's important that there is a possibility for choice. It has an extremely important role in uh, the whole running of an autonomous uh, environment. It can be choice of activities, choice of partners, or choice of personal aims within the curricular guidelines. And last but not least is the evaluation and the assessment. As if some of you have read any of my books or papers, you will see that I claim that evaluation and assessment is the pivot of learning autonomy. Not at the end of a term or at, for an, exa uh, an exam, but a continuous evaluation assessment in the daily running of the learning. But now let me take the, uh, the elements on their own. First of all, the role of the teacher. Already the cartoon I showed you pointed at this, that the role of the teacher in my view is not to teach, but to support learning. When I run courses for inset teachers, I say to them, don't think a lot about how you teach this or that, but think in terms of how you support your students' learning. That means that your face in the classroom will be in addition. It will not be up front by the blackboard, as I said earlier on, but it will be among your students. You will be a co-learner. And of course, very often, also the 
autonomous classroom or environment has been misinterpreted as somewhere where there is no need for the teacher. It's a matter of the teacher disappearing. But as David Biddy says in his book about learn autonomy in 91, learn autonomy does not entail an application of initiative and control on the part of the teacher. He remains responsible for ensuring that learning takes place. In my view, it's also important to have confidence in the learner's ability to be able to take over responsibility. So in order to let go, we have to have this confidence. And I go a bit further saying, in order for the learners to take over, it's not because the learners do not want to do it, it's our responsibility as teachers to see that learn autonomy is developed. And I refer to my book from 2003, that developing learn autonomy is the teacher's responsibility. The second element I pointed at was teaching in groups. And first of all, it facilitates pair work. It doesn't mean that they have to work together, all of them, but it's easy when they sit there to have them work in pairs. As said earlier on, it facilitates peer tutoring. It makes it much easier to be independent of the teacher, which is good for the learners, but it's definitely also for the teachers. You might remember that Carson in the interview talked about a list of helpers that he had on the list. And last but not least, it supports social learning. The aspect about authenticity, I'll start by quoting myself. I gave this a, I gave a keynote talk in York at the IATF conference there in 2001. And that's when I first publicly said this. You are now entering a foreign language classroom. Forget that you are normal. I claim that this should be written outside many, many foreign language classrooms. Because in many cases, also if you look at the course books, Things happen in the foreign language classroom that is not normal. If you look at the course books, if you look at unit one, if a long time is spent on having learners asking each other for what their names are. One could perhaps think that that is ages ago that that happened, but I have just recently gone through many of the new books and my 12 year old son uh, what is it uh, <laughs> I've lost it hmm. the word has gone uh, he is at school now and has just started uh, English and my grandchild sorry my grand grandchild and what did he learn the first week? He could say, my name is Jonathan. I said, yes, I know. Yeah, but that's what I've learned in English. The next week he had learned to say, I am nine years old. Fantastic. But he, could, he couldn't communicate at all. So this is the case that they actually do things that are not normal. And I could go on. Teachers do things that are not normal. They ask questions that are not normal. So to me, authenticity is a matter of the ongoing communication between teacher and learners and between learners. Another idea I have for the teachers that I have at my courses is never ever ask a question that you can answer yourself. That is difficult, I can tell you me a lot of time before I realized it.
also it's important that the social relationship between participants in the learning environment is authentic. Even though teachers are co-learners, they are, as David Liddy said, also responsible that learning takes place and we have to take the steps accordingly. As regards authenticity, I will uh, point at the purpose of the tasks and activities that are un undertaken in the autonomous uh, environment. First of all, the activity types are, as I've mentioned earlier, based on their previous knowledge. It's a matter of constructivism versus constructivism. And first of all, learners are personally involved. Secondly, it's a matter of language production instead of language reproduction. You think of many of the activities and tasks in our course books, they are to a large extent uh, language reproduction instead of language production. And I return again to Carsten's uh, way of it describing this, it's something that we do. So I've just mentioned four ways of having language production rather than language reproduction, that the learners produce questions about the text themselves, or text production in pairs or in small groups, an excellent authentic activity, could also be make plays, drama, PowerPoint presentations, talks, where they include their identity and when where it is a, an authentic communication. At, at beginner's level, it could easily be that they, in pairs of groups, make a quiz and run it. And finally, as regards activity types, it's important that the products have a purpose, that is a defined purpose, that they are not just doing it because of the teacher, but it has a purpose for the learners themselves, and this is clearly defined. In my classes, most of the products designed by the learners were used by their peers. I have to be very, very precise with this hour. No, no, yes, we still got time. The important thing, and this is what we will talk more about, and the advert that is the documentation of learning. Here you see one of my learners with her love book. I changed the word her diary that you heard from Nana, that she liked her diary, but I'm talking about the love book and can also refer to my article about love books, the tool for developing learning autonomy. But here you see Julie, and she is documenting what she's doing during a lesson in her love book. It's not done at the end of a lesson, but during a lesson. In my view, I use the love book to show the process. Here the learners write down what they do, why they do it, and also what they might learn from it, words, expressions, and also evaluation of the lesson. If it comes to bigger products, then we have the portfolios where we keep them. And of course, we can go into a lot of discussion about the portfolios. Finally, I have a place on the floor for posters. They can be learner decide and or they can be teacher and learner designed. And they might show, for instance, a dance over who does what, because not uh, they are not doing the same, all of them. They're doing different things according to their own aims. There might be ideas, a poster with ideas, for instance, for homework. You can do this at home, but 
and thing to remember the moms or their parents. Here you see the group from before. Here you can see the laptop in front of her. You can see a product. In this case, it looks as if it's uh, an activity that we call picture plus text. It can start from the very beginning and go up to uh, late last uh, years at intermediate level. The products are kept in the portfolios in the classroom, but they are given to the parents uh, in connect connection with the parents' meetings so that the parents can follow uh, the progress of their children. This is, of course, also the case with the laptops. And finally, you see the posters on the wall with the various things that I mentioned before. I'll come to the clear demands and expectations. And again, I make use of a cartoon. It is a Danish cartoon this time, so I've translated it. This lovely boy says, that's it, enough for today. And he says, see you tomorrow. However, there was something wrong. I do not think that it was the teacher's uh, idea that he should leave. And he says, I thought I could decide myself. So I can't. Say enough, I can't express enough how important it is in order to run an autonomous learning environment that the students know what is demanded of them, what is expected of them, so they know where their limits are and what they can decide. We are still within an institutional context. But within these demands and expectations, I said, it's of utmost importance that there is choice. It doesn't have to be a lot of uh, possibilities, but choice is important. If we go to the literature, we will see that Yoda mentions it again and again, that it motiv motivates the learners. Little has been one of his, also stressed uh, that choice requires reflection. If you make a choice, you have to reflect. Of course, this can be supported by the teacher's uh, attitude. So instead of just that, I want to do this, the teacher can say, well, it's not enough to say that you want to do this, but you have to uh, say why you want it. And at the end of the activity, what was the result? If that is done, then there is no doubt that choice heightens awareness of learning and also that it leads to responsibility in part of the learners that it was my own result in 1973 and it supports self-esteem what i'm referring here is to my article with dennis the menace an eight phd student that really developed self-esteem. Last, not least, evaluation. I have taken a quote from Barnes because it's not just a matter of that it's, it's demanded from official site, but he mentions that it's important that because, especially because they are the ones to learn, if we really want to support them, then it's necessary that we know what they learn, what they feel that they learn. So his point about every pupil in the class will go away with a version of the lesson, which in some respect is different from all the other pupils' versions, because what each uh, pupil brings to the classroom will be different, really to me supports <coughs> the whole idea of evaluation.
as I said previously, <laughs> this is really <clears throat> what we'll go into in Denverton. But the whole point is that evaluation is learning. As you can see here, it's at the end of a lesson, the two peers talk about their evaluation of the lesson, what was good, what was bad, what could be improved, what are we going to do tomorrow. So it's part of their learning. Now, with what results? From my view, from the teacher's point of view, I will point at positive and active learners. And there is no doubt that teachers can see how optimal that is. But it's not only positive and active learners. It's also that this leads to high level of linguistic competence. This is, of course, relative. <coughs> but the point is that all of them reach a level of linguistic competence. In a minute, you'll see an example from one of my weakest learners. But they do, if you see to it that it's authentic, communication, if you see to it with peer tutoring, etc., all the, the elements I've just mentioned, then the result is a high level of linguistic competence. And that is, of course, what we realized when we had the LALE project learner acquisition in an autonomous learning environment. What is important to me and what I think is really needed in our surroundings nowadays is that we that our learners gain a high level of self-esteem and I would claim that that is the case. Also that the autonomous language classroom caters for all learners is to me more and more important because of the inclusion. I'm sure that in your environment you also have the problem with inclusion. It looks as if all the claims for a good inclusive pedagogy is catered for in the autonomous learning environment. The next one, if you're a teacher, you know how that much this means that we have satisfied parents, even though some of them doubted whether or not it was okay what I did, because that was definitely not the way they learned English when they were children. But as soon as they realized that their children actually liked the English lessons, that they became very good at English, and they felt good. They had no problems at home with homework or worries about going to the English lessons. They were satisfied. And of course, it's satisfying for the teacher because of these arguments. And also that the responsibility is not only mine or ours, it's shared now with the learners. As a teacher in Spain, in one of her evaluations, uh, who has st had started uh, developing learner autonomy, said, I have now become a human being in my classroom. I think that is, that is Right. I'll just give you two examples from the LALA project. We had, uh, it was the uh, second year of English and they uh, had peer-to-peer -peer talks. So we, they were asked to talk about things of their own interest in groups. We did not have a exact uh, second research group, but we had a group of uh, German learners at the same level who loved their English teacher and who thought that they were very good at English. They were taught according to a coursework called Greenline in those days. And here is the sort of most or the best uh, talk we had from that group. And I'll just read through it. I'm going to have a family with two unchild children and I'm going to live in a big house. That was one of the most sort of creative uh, sentences from these German learners. And notice what happens. 
her, co her PSAs, she couldn't care less. She couldn't care less about family and children and house. She says, what is your birth? when is your birthday? And to make it even worse, the first one responds, my birthday is now. And look again what happens. Ah, my birthday is on the 16th. Ah, yeah, um, now. When is your sister's birthday? My sister's birthday is on the 27th of April. What films do you like? And you see that it's destructive and thrills from a course book. No coherence whatsoever. And if we compare this, then we chose a talk from two of my learners, two of my weakest learners, Dennis and Lasse. And we chose this because uh, there was also a birthday that day. So, and notice this is a, not at all correct English, but the communication and the communicative strategies are fantastic, I think. So Dennis says that is the weakest one. What did, what should you do today? And that's a similarly weak. Today I am. I shall have my birthday. And then he says, have your birthday today? Yes, happy birthday. Thank you. So I should home and, and, and make, make. He knew that he had learned something about the past tense. A cake to my, and again, then it comes in and supports him. Birthday cake. Cake, yes. So I should have this cake and so to afternoon my, my friend is coming, my dad and my friend is coming to you, so I should have birthday. Not good English, but what a communicative competence. I hope you agree. And I'll finish with the voice of a learner as regards with what results. I've learned English, planning my own work, cooperation, have had and used an independent responsibility have taken part in the planning of learning. It makes one want to do, learn something for oneself. Already from Edith Page. Thank you for now. And now time for questions. And how do we do this? How do we do that, Jürgen? I can't hear you. Hello, Lenny, can you hear me? Yes, you yes. can hear me now. Oh, I right. So thank oh, you very much you. for um, the very nice, interesting presentation about learner autonomy. I think um, there were many things that struck me, you know, um, how you s started off with the metaphor of the rope skipping. Uh, I thought it was a nice one. The Chinese proverb um, about empowerment. Um, and it's, it strikes to me as odd that this has been around for such a long time already in, uh, in Denmark in your work, because some of the uh, insights and the, the research elements are, are actually pretty new, are used today still quite a lot. So I'm actually surprised to hear that it's been going on for such a long time already. Um, I remember to the one about Barnes, 1976, that input is not in takes and his idea of you have to let things go. Um, I thought it was very nice uh, insight and idea as well. Um, and then, of course, you came up with your uh, slide with all the elements that are important to establishing an autonomous learner environment with the role of the teacher, uh, authenticity and all these elements in it. Huh? Maybe as just a way to, to start off the questions, um, I have a question about this element of authenticity and you, you meant that it, it's about the uh, relationship between the student and the learner, uh, sorry, the student and the teacher. Uh, it has to be authentic, but does that mean that the learner teacher role disappears or is it still there? Could you perhaps explain again how you see that authenticity in that role? It was slide 15, if I remember well. <clears throat> I thought it was so clever with these. Here we are. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that it, it uh, what I mean by that it, it's. Uh, that it's authentic, the social relationships. 
is really that you accept that sometimes you are the teacher. Sometimes you do tell them to do things because that is your job as a teacher. You have uh, you have learned things that you have to uh, distribute to the students. And sometimes you have to accept that you are a co-learner, that there are things that you don't know because you have to listen to the students. And I think that's what I mean by it, that it's not that you're not always a teacher in the traditional sense or a learner in the traditional sense, but you are both a co-learner and a teacher. And I think it's important that we stress that and that we say, well, this is my responsibility. Therefore, this is what I would like you to do afterwards. We can discuss whether it was good for you or not. But I, because of my background and my knowledge, I want you to try it out. And that's where the evaluation comes in, is something very important. But I, I think I have the experience that some teachers say, oh, we are good pals with our learners. And then it, 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 it disappears, this role of that I am also a teacher and I am responsible for this. Does this make sense to you? And also with the learners that they actually, I, I think it's something that you have to work a lot on to make them, for instance, in my, my uh, classes, they are not allowed to come up with a critic or critique. They yeah, have to yeah. say, well, in my view, mm -hmm. I think that this could be improved in this or that way. So yeah. they have to mm -hmm. be uh, constructive at the same time. Mm -hmm. okay. So I think that is something that you have to work a lot on mm -hmm. in the autonomous class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it makes sense, definitely. I was just wondering if it changes things if the teacher is a native speaker, because I mean, obviously, he's less of a co-learner than uh, a non-native speaker as well, because he, he speaks the language <laughs> as his native language. Um, would that relationship yeah, still apply? Is, hmm? No, but that's, I mean, I'm hmm? not a native speaker, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is very obvious. But yeah. from the very first lesson, the very first minute, I speak English in my classes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. English yeah, yeah. is spoken all the time. Yeah, okay. One more thing, what would you say to a teacher who said like, I'm just afraid of letting go uh, control in my classroom if, if I take this learner-centered approach? Uh, how would you advise such a teacher who is insecure about giving up control, you know, of uh, who learns what at what time and what moment? <laughs> What I can say is that uh, it's, it's important. You don't give up control. I, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to realize that you don't give up control. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of you as a teacher to learn how can I support my learners in setting up these, for instance, this work plan? How can I support them in taking over control? Mm -hmm. I think that is the big yeah. uh, question. It's not a matter of be because in what in that way I still control it, but I just pass over the control as part of my controlling them. So that the worst thing you can do is actually to let go completely, at, at least in the institutional context. That's a mistake, and I think that's both what David Little and myself really stress very heavily. It's not a matter of letting go, letting go of our control. But you don't do it directly, you're right in that respect. I Sorry, I, I guess I couldn't help seeing Eileen's repeat after me in real life. That was exactly what I was after. We do things in the classroom that has nothing to do with real life. It's true. And how often, uh, Ivy, do we as, uh, as, as teachers or as persons in real life put up a pencil in front of a person and say, what is this? Mm -hmm. Then we would yeah. be put into the, the asylum straight away. So that it's exactly what what I meant by this. Yeah. So thank you uh -huh. for the idea. Yeah. 
the idea of sharing responsibility and control of learning. Huh? Adelia notices there as well huh? in Mexico. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Lenny. I think um, we've had many, many good insights into our roles as teachers and many things that we can learn from. And the, as Eileen is now <laughs> kind of remarking there, the story of the birthday at the end really summarized it all, didn't it? Huh? In uh, how we yeah, can take a very is, different approach yeah, to... Uh, that is the result. And I have, yeah. I, have to, I have to mention, I know it, I'll make it short, but I have mm -hmm. to mention that I first experienced this uh, uh, effect of the, the green line uh, mm -hmm. when many many years ago we had the first uh, connection with a German class it was the second year of English and uh, that was when they uh, mailed to each other wrote letters uh, on the computer mm -hmm. and uh, after a couple of months my students said no we don't want to write with them any longer it's good practice and you are in touch with people. No, no, they, they, they are very strange. They are very strange. We don't like what they say about their uh, sisters and brothers. They say that they are lazy and they say that they are not nice and they, they say awful things about their brothers and sisters. And at that uh, point I couldn't say, well, we can't be helped. We have to say goodbye and thank you very much. And it was first years later when we work with the uh, uh, Lala project and went into the Green Line book and saw that all the structures that they learned was actually my brother is lazy, my brother. So after that uh, experience, I realized that it's not uh, at all that you just say something. It's very important in intercultural uh, connections that what you learn to say. So that was just a small story about that. Okay. Now I can't hear you again, you but never mind. No, you cannot hear me? Yes, okay. Now I can. Yeah. Now I can. Yes. So I was just uh, thanking you again for your wonderful contribution. We of course look forward to hearing more in uh, you know, at the University of Antwerp on the third and the fourth of March. I'm just checking the program here and I see that your talk is on uh, on the Sometimes. Friday afternoon, yes, on yes. 4 March. Uh, and other keynote speakers that day are Anna Maria Pinter uh, from the University of Warwick. Huh? Uh, that's on the Thursday, the 3rd of March. Chris van der Poel of the University of Antwerp herself is one of the main organizers. Uh, we'll be talking on the, the Thursday afternoon. On Friday, we have your session then as well. And there is also Brian Morrison from Glasgow University, who we're sending from Belta, who is talking on the 3rd of March as well. So we're all looking forward to that. We hope to see some of the participants there as well, obviously, and we're just looking forward to hearing more. I'd like to pass on to John now, who will say a little bit more about the next, um, um, and James is coming up there as well, and we'll say a little bit more. Before you, before you cut me off, I would like yeah. to thank you also, the mm -hmm. participants. Thank you uh -huh. for your comments. I'll uh, look forward to reading them now we yeah. have finished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lenny. James is there now. No. Yes, it's me. Uh, yes, so um, let me just say thank you very much again, Lenny. That was great. Thank you, Jürgen, for hosting. It was very interesting, and we're really looking forward to the, the conference in Antwerp. Uh, before everyone leaves, uh, I just want to spend like just one minute of your time before you can go, just to let you know about a couple of things. Uh, so the first thing I want to mention is our next uh, Sunday with Delta webinar, which will be uh, next month. It's with Laura Patsko. Uh, we don't have the date there on the poster. Uh, I think it's the, it's the 28th, John, is that right? Something like that. Yep, 28th of February. She's going to be talking about le uh, teaching pronunciation and listening for English as a lingua franca. Uh, Laura's a great speaker and it's a fascinating subject. So we hope to see you there. And then uh, one other thing is uh, we have recently launched uh, an international membership option for Belta. So if you like, if you enjoy this webinar and you like what Belta is doing, then uh, you can become a member of Belta and it will, it will cost you a bargain of 25 euros a year, which is very cheap. And uh, you can become a member and uh, with that you will get access to our archive of webinars and you'll also get sent a PDF copy of our journal, the Belta Bulletin. Um, 
and of course you'll get to support us doing things like this webinar which we make available to everybody so if you're uh, interested in becoming a member of Delta uh, then you can see the, the, the website there just go to our website deltabelgium.com and uh, go to the becoming a member option okay that's all I wanted to say uh, thank you again to Lainey and to Jürgen uh, thank you to all of you for being here and we'll see you next month with Laura Patsko okay thank you everyone thank you